Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Gimmel, and I want to thank you all for joining us for today's member webinar titled Consumer Initiated Genetic Testing, the Genetic Counselor's Role. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. We encourage questions to be asked throughout the presentation. As a courtesy to our presenters, all attendees are currently muted. Please utilize the Zoom Q&A box for questions. Um, these questions will be read aloud during the last 10 minutes of the webinar. You also can use the chat function to have discussions throughout the presentation. The learning objectives for today are to identify the benefits and limitations of various types of consumer initiated genetic testing, discuss the variety of roles genetic counselors play when a patient presents to clinic with consumer initiated genetic test results and to review the unique psychosocial strategies involved in achieving genetic counseling goals and patient satisfaction when testing was initiated by the patient. I'm excited to announce our three speakers for today. Our first speaker is Kelly Tegney. She is a head of genetic counseling services at Color Health and lead genetic counselor for the National Institute of Health All of Us Research Program Genetic Counseling Resource. She joined Color in 2015 with a focus on counseling patients and their families at risk for hereditary adult onset condition, conditions and expanding Color's mission of broadening access to genetic services. Kelly has previous clinical genetic counseling experience working at UCLA, Kaiser, and Veterans Administration Los Angeles as a general adult and research genetic counselor. Our second speaker is Heather. Heather Glessner is a board certified and multi-state licensed genetic counselor with diverse experience in the field. Prior to joining Everly Health in 2019, she spent more than 10 years in clinical practice at an academic medical center where she provided services in the areas of prenatal, infertility, cancer, and general genetics. At Everly, Heather is a senior manager and serves as the clinical lead for neurology and whole exome sequencing, as well as the co-lead for healthy adult testing. Her values align strongly with the company's passion for providing accessible, high-quality genetic counseling and responsible oversight of consumer-initiated genetic testing. And then our third speaker is Get Gretchen Throne. Uh, Gretchen Throne is a genetic counselor at Geisinger Medical Center in Danville. She joined Geisinger in 2019, where she had been able to combine her passion for clinical genetics, particularly pediatric cancer, and her desire to participate in research. In her clinical role, she works for medical genetics, seeing both pediatric and adult patients. As a genetic counselor in research, one of her roles includes returning results that have been initiated through Geisinger, Geisinger's MyCode Community Health Initiative. So a huge thank you to our three speakers, and I'll pass it off to Kelly. Great, thanks so much, Amber. So um, as Amber mentioned, I'm Kelly Tagney. I lead the genetic counseling services at Color Health. Um, and before we get to our three case examples today, just wanted to set the table um, about consumer-initiated genetic testing, um, or as we refer here as CIGT. So consumer-initiated genetic testing um, goes by many names, elective, uh, proactive, or healthy genetic testing. Um, for the purposes of the talk today, we will define this testing as uh, genetic testing that occurs outside of a medical need as defined by an expert clinician. Um, so kind of self-explanatory, um, it's you know, consumer-initiated. Um, it's important to note that consumer-initiated genetic testing is not one type of laboratory or testing or assay. Um, there's a broad spectrum of labs who offer consumer-initiated genetic testing, um, including some who are entirely directed towards consumers, others um, who have significant overlap with panels frequently ordered um, by providers in the setting of clinical or diagnostic testing. So really a wide um, variety of, of offerings here. And just a reminder that today's session is not an opportunity to dig into each individual's lab processes or panels or strategies. Um, also should uh, be presented without commercial bias in either direction. 
Uh, but the focus of today's webinar is really on our role as genetic counselors as we encounter consumer initiated genetic testing more often um, due to things like increased demand from consumers themselves. Um, and important to remember that there are both benefits and limitations to particular offerings that are important to address as they impact our practice as genetic counselors and how we support our patients. Um, so it's, it's also very important to acknowledge that more patients have undergone consumer initiated genetic testing um, in the last several years by orders of magnitude and then have undergone clinical genetic testing facilitated by an expert clinician. Um, so we really must recognize as a community that these tests do play an important role in our patients and our patients' families' lives um, and can help to familiarize our society with basic concepts of genetic testing so that we then as genetic counselors can fill the gaps um, in the experience of consumer-initiated genetic testing with our unique expertise and skills. Um, you know, why do patients pursue this type of testing? Um, it's helpful to remember that each patient has their own uh, personal motivations for pursuing consumer-initiated genetic testing. Um, and we'll see today that um, in the case examples that um, there are many different types of motivations um, coming to each individual and that each of those reasons are valid to those individuals themselves. All right, so on to our first case example of consumer initiated genetic testing. Um, so I'm here to present a clinical case um, that my team at Color encountered fairly recently, just a few weeks back actually, um, in which a 39 year old patient, the one indicated here in the pedigree, um, our proband came to Color with a very Lynch-like uh, paternal family history. Um, and actually had a known familial mutation in MSH2. So you can see that the patient's paternal aunt was diagnosed with um, ovarian cancer at an early age, um, later colorectal cancer. And um, the aunt's colorectal cancer diagnosis was found, uh, was kind of the, the preemptive um, reason for testing for Lynch syndrome. Um, and uh, that individual was found to have an MSH2 uh, germline mutation. So through appropriate cascade testing, our 39 year old patient underwent single site testing for the known familial mutation in MSH2 through LabCorp. Um, almost a decade ago. So they had had these results for quite a number of years. Um, and important to note that at that time, single site testing for a known familiar, known familial mutation was uh, pretty commonplace. So since then, um, this individual reported having appropriate cancer screening and management for Lynch syndrome um, through their own healthcare provider. So including regular colonoscopies, um, a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy at 34. Um, and furthermore, all of the other at-risk adult family members had undergone MSH2 single site uh, testing for that known familial mutation. So including the patient's brother, father, paternal cousin. So as you can see, um, the patient's uh, children are all minors um, who have not yet had genetic testing. So you may be thinking, why would this individual initiate consumer initiated genetic testing uh, through a company like Color if they already had their answer and they were already getting appropriate medical management? Well, uh, that leads us nicely uh, to the next bit of this story. So the client went on to describe that they were more they more recently had undergone um, ancestry DNA testing and ran their raw data through Prometheus um, and uh, right under their Lynch uh, mutation, which was identified through Prometheus, it said something about uh, that it picked up a mutation for long QT syndrome. Um, so that's when I think all of us as genetic counselors uh, may get this reaction of, uh-huh, okay, sure, uh, you know, your raw data, but is that real? Um, you know, it, it turned out that before I even had to explain 
Um, the client was actually savvy enough to understand that direct-to-consumer raw data has its fair share of unconfirmed clinical findings. Um, so this individual actually sought out consumer-initiated genetic testing to put their mind at ease that that actually wasn't a true finding. Um, so they were really hoping that this was not going to be confirmed. Um, and they actually didn't seem too concerned about the additional finding that was picked up. Um, you know, they, they did have a, um, an already known genetic diagnosis and had been through testing and counseling for Lynch syndrome. Um, so it was pretty savvy um, when it came to genetic understanding and uh, genetic counseling, but wanted to do their due diligence um, for themselves and for their three children, given um, the actual physical symptoms they were experiencing. So when we dug a little bit more into this patient's cardiovascular history, um, they mentioned that in their 20s, they had some unusual um, chest pain that went on um, and actually saw a cardiologist at that time and had a normal EKG. Um, more recently, um, unfortunately, this patient's husband passed away unexpectedly and was um, you know, describing how stressed um, and under so much um, emotional grief, um, you know, they were they were going through, and so did at that time in their life started having more heart palpitations, um, but didn't have any sort of follow up. Um, and then also mentioned, uh, you know, about three months ago, um, almost fainting um, uh, as well. When it came to family history, uh, the, the patient reported that their paternal grandfather, who, um, if you recall, was also the same relative with early onset colorectal cancer, um, had a heart attack at 45, uh, but then went on to be uh, fairly healthy and lived until 92 when they passed away due to complications from um, gastric cancer. Um, on the other side of the family, the patient reported that one maternal uncle who died at age 50 um, of unknown causes um, was also, uh, you know, something uh, suspicious in regards to this indication, but otherwise fairly healthy family um, and no other known cardiovascular history. So turns out that color did confirm the KCNQ1 gene mutation that Prometheus had originally picked up. Um, you know, we had a lot of discussion that this uh, mutation is commonly associated with long QT syndrome. Um, and as previously described, this patient had previously in its seen a cardiologist, but it was a number of years ago. Um, so they were actually going to reach back out to them, share these results and determine kind of next steps in their care. Um, we also discussed that due to the complex nature of this condition a referral to a cardiologist that does specialize in arrhythmia disorders, like a electrophysiologist um, may be discussed. Um, we also, you know, also discussed and provided some anticipatory guidance of what to expect for cardiac evaluations, potential medications, activity modifications that might be um, recommended depending on their cardiac evaluation. And, uh, you know, the patient brought up that they did have a summer beach vacation coming up um, and was now worried to let their children swim or do activities in the summer. Um, so we'll be coordinating um, with their pediatrician for genetic testing um, in the meantime. Um, so one limitation to at least our testing at color is that we do not test minors through consumer initiated genetic testing. Um, so we do um, try to have a hand in really getting them connected to the right care provider to initiate that if it is, um, recommended for minors to get testing of this particular mutation found. Um, and then the other aspect is that the other family members on, uh, you know, sibling and also um, parents, um, as well as potentially others may have this KCNQ1 gene mutation. Um, and although some of them had undergone genetic testing, it was again for that single site MSH2 mutation. So, um, you know, this is where, uh, you know, their clinicians can order testing or they could also um, um, initiate consumer genetic testing. 
So some key takeaways from this case. Um, you know, not all uh, positive results from raw data will be false positives. Um, important to remember, you know, I think um, in all cases, clinical confirmation is required um, and recommended for, you know, changing one's medical care, obviously. Um, but it's, it's becoming more common that individuals uh, not only undergo, um, you know, consumer initiated or direct to consumer genetic testing, but also run that raw data through these third party sites. Um, and so uh, you as genetic counselors might have been encountered a similar situation already. Um, and so important to not just brush those all off. Um, also remembering that patients with one known hereditary syndrome may still be appropriate for additional testing via larger gene panels. Um, I think we've, you know, as a, as a society can come to recognize this, but, um, you know, this patient's cardiovascular history was not particularly striking otherwise. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is one aspect of consumer initiated genetic testing that, that is quite helpful in sometimes catching those additional mutations um, otherwise. And then I will pass it on to Heather for our next case. And happy to take questions at the, the end of this webinar as well. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, so for case number two, I am going to be presenting um, an example of consumer initiated whole exome sequencing. So to give you an idea and set the stage as far as um, how we came to counsel um, this family after their testing, um, the test that, that was done was a consumer-initiated, sponsored whole exome uh, sequencing test that was specifically marketed to individuals suspected of having mitochondrial disease. Uh, therefore, um, you know, at least 1,800 different nuclear genes associated with mitochondrial disease were targeted, um, along then with any other um, genes that made sense um, for the patient's phenotypic profile. And so uh, in order to initiate the testing, the patients then filled out an extensive intake that inquired all about their medical history and their specific concerning symptoms. And once they met um, those eligibility criteria, deeming them able to take the test, that test order was then reviewed by both a genetic counselor and a physician, um, both that it made um, medical sense for them to undergo the testing, and then also to make sure that the testing would meet that consumer's expectations for what they were looking for, uh, just to make sure everyone was on the same page. Once all um, of those checks and balances were completed, the testing was then performed at a lab with CLIA and CAP certification. And so for this particular case, the patient was a 33-year-old male, and the history that was presented on his test order included that he had normal development until about 16 months of age, and at that point, his mother reported that he had both regression of motor skills and speech. So prior to the regression, he had been walking independently, um, speaking in one and sometimes two word phrases. Um, but with the regression, he reverted back to crawling or army crawling, and his speech was greatly diminished. Around that same time, he began tilting his head to the side and he was diagnosed with having pediatric migraines and his regression was attributed to these headaches. Then um, in the months to come, he was diagnosed with hearing loss and continued to progress and developed ataxia, absent reflexes, a decrease in his eye movements, scoliosis, myopathy, and muscular atrophy. Um, the, his condition proceeded to deteriorate, and by age 16, he needed a wheelchair for ambulation, uh, so clearly something was going on for this individual. He developed abnormalities in gut motility and swallowing difficulty, 
And then was tacked on a diagnosis of a bulbar palsy uh, following experiencing facial weakness and, and continued difficulty with that speech. Uh, and then more recently, the family reported that as an adult, he's been experiencing um, kind of the in, unusual involuntary jerking of his legs. Um, and, and because of his medical needs, he currently lives with his parents in their home as they help to care for him. So if we take a look at his family history, um, so again, he is 33, um, no children of his own. His father's side of the family was non-contributory, um, really nothing of report there. He has a full sister um, with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, along with atrial fibrillation, and a first cousin. Um, with the same findings. Um, so the family had told perhaps there was something going on here, um, mitochondrial that was in the form of a spectrum. Um, otherwise there was an aunt with a brain AVM, um, first cousin once removed with multiple sclerosis and a history of Alzheimer's disease, but really nobody else in the family with the same constellation of finding as the patient. And the family, um, like you might expect, had really been on that classic diagnostic odyssey. These were, um, you know, involved parents advocating for their child, had seen numerous specialists and had had various genetic tests performed along the way. They um, were not able to produce copies of his genetic testing um, to share with me when I met with them. Um, but were, were very good historians and able to let me know they knew that he had had previous negative testing for spinocerebellar ataxia, Charcot-Marie Tooth, and Friedrich ataxia, as well as muscle biopsies and nerve conduction studies, all of which had come back normal. Um, so they'd always been met with, with dead ends. And then in 2015, um, kind of exploring more diagnostic um, evaluations, he was identified to have a pathogenic variant in OPA1 and a diagnosis of chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia was made. Um, and while this may explain the, the weakness of his eye muscles that he was experiencing, the family really was not, not convinced and was quite frustrated, felt like they were being brushed off with this diagnosis because it really didn't explain the other whole constellation and full body involvement um, of, of what he had. But they kind of didn't know where else to go from there. They really felt like they had exhausted all of their options kind of had resigned that they didn't know what this was, um, but it, it was what it was essentially. And then um, in the beginning of this year, they had this opportunity to engage in this consumer initiated whole exome testing. And essentially they decided that they didn't have anything to lose, um, that this was available to them. And, and that's essentially um, kind of the, the mindset they went into the testing. Like they basically thought they had done everything else, might as well um, um, take a shot with this testing. And when we got the results back, we found that he had a homozygous pathogenic variant identified in C10ORF2, also known as the twink gene. And that was consistent with the molecular diagnosis of infantile onset spinocerebellar ataxia, or what can also be called mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome 7. Uh, this is a founder variant that's been well documented uh, and homozygosity also well documented and known to be present with classic infantile onset spinocerebellar ataxia. So this is a picture of the patient. Uh, his family was kind enough to provide this uh, to me for today. 
Um, and, and they were just so very, very grateful um, for the testing. And for over 30 years, they had been trying to figure out what was going on with their son. And on a whim, you know, for this, you know, at home genetics test, it was able to give them the answer. And it was so very powerful to them. Um, they were blown away. Um, when we take a look at the different symptoms that we see, with the infantile onset form of this condition, it's progressive neurodegenerative, um, which he exhibited um, typical development until one year of life, the ataxia, hypotonia, loss of reflexes, um, ophthalmoplegia and, and deafness are expected to develop, which was again consistent. Um, generally speaking, affected individuals are no longer ambulatory by adolescence, neurogenic scoliosis, and when routine labs, metabolic profiles, and muscle biopsies are done, it's all expected to be normal. And the family just couldn't believe that the, the classic description of this condition of fat, uh, fit their son so very, very well. What was striking to me is that in addition to, um, with all the above things, what can happen particularly as individuals age with this disease is that myoclonic jerks or clonic seizures can develop. Um, and again, it's typically into adulthood, but they can progress to status epilepticus and, and actually become fatal. Uh, and so really this testing felt like it was coming right at the right time for this family and that he had recently started to experience these unexplained jerking of his legs. And we discussed the importance of taking this result to his medical team and you know, reestablishing a connection with neurology um, to be able to determine if indeed what he was experiencing was seizure activity. Um, and they were very grateful to have that information. In addition, um, with his full sister being of childbearing age but not having any children, um, then any further testing for her or family members um, could be done now that they knew uh, what the condition was in the family. So as takeaways, um, I think, you know, the, the concept of consumer initiated whole exome um, might take some people aback a little bit. Um, it's, it's a bit unconventional um, from kind of the clinical practice of whole exome. But what we've seen anecdotally for the positives that we've had in this testing is that we're, we're finding this generation of individuals whose diagnostic odyssey ended before whole exome was mainstream in clinic. And, and certainly they're still desiring information, but they just don't know how to get it. So by making it consumer initiated, it's definitely increasing access uh, for genetic testing in this population. And by finding these answers, even if it is by an alternative or not so conventional method, it really does allow for anticipatory guidance and then cascade testing for additional family members. Um, and, and with that, I will turn it over to Gretchen so she can report case number two, or three, sorry. All right, thank you so much, Heather. So first, I just want to say thank you to NSGC for giving me the opportunity to present today. I'm very excited to share my case with all of you. Um, so the case that I'm going to present today really sheds light on the complexities of variants that may be identified through consumer-initiated testing, but it also shows that when patients are referred to genetics due to their consumer-initiated testing, they may actually learn about other genetic testing or genetic evaluations that are available to them. So onward to the case. So referral came into our clinic for a 49-year-old female with chronic arthralgias of knees and hips from her primary care provider. So slightly vague to say the least. Uh, thankfully, there was a note indicating that the patient was found to have a variant in the FNFB gene associated with familial Mediterranean fever, as well as a variant in the FAH gene associated with parasomemia type 1. 
through chart review, I learned that she does have a history of arthralgias of her knees and hips, but genetic testing was not scanned into her chart, so I wasn't sure exactly what was going on there. Um, she was also followed by rheumatology for psoriatic arthritis. Rheumatology noted that she reported inflammation of her joints as a child, but she didn't recall any kind of specific diagnosis at that time. She also reported fevers every couple of weeks, the highest being about 100.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in addition, she reported chronic abdominal pain with smooth stools, and she had a history of diverticulitis. Her PCP had actually started her on colchicine a few months prior to her rheumatology appointment. And in the note, the rheumatology note, it was reported, or she reported feeling better from a GI standpoint. Not 100% sure on the details of why her PCP started her on colchicine that I could not find in her chart. At the time of her most recent rheumatology appointment, she informed her provider that she had pursued genetic testing through DITGT, um, which identified a variant in the MESC gene. From that point, rheumatology actually placed orders for familial Mediterranean fever. Um, and looking at Epic, it was very clear that he had placed the orders. They're also a guy from our provider, so I was able to see it, but it was marked as canceled. So it looked like it was never collected. Um, and of note, also her biochemical studies were not suggestive of Mediterranean fever. But anyway, I was just a little uncertain about what was going on exactly. So I reached out to the patient a few days prior to her appointment. I let her know that rheumatology had ordered genetic testing for her. And if she had submitted a sample, we could actually wait to have her appointment until her results came back, because then we can review those report, that report and really go through her results in depth. She vehemently informed me that she has not completed genetic testing other than through direct-to-consumer testing or consumer-initiated testing. And she did not submit a sample for the testing that rheumatology had ordered. She was very, very clear on that. <laughs> um, she explained that she had pursued genetic testing through consumer-initiated genetic testing to just seek more information about her own health, so definitely an information seeker. She didn't have really any particular reasons other than that. Um, so we discussed that it was fine to proceed with her appointment. I just requested that she fax me the results so I could see them prior. She faxed me her results. I don't think I got the whole report, but there were indications of a marker variant in MESC as well as a marker variant in FAH. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so while her carrier status for tyrosinemia is important for the purpose of today's presentation, I just want to pay a particular attention to familial Mediterranean fever. Um, I'll just review it real quickly, just because I know we probably have a wide variety of genetic specialists, non-genetic specialists on the meeting today, and I just want to make sure everyone is very well informed. Um, so for familial Mediterranean fever, or shortened to FMF. This is an inherited condition that is characterized by recurrent episodes of painful inflammation of abdomen, chest, and joints. First episode often occurs in childhood or teenage years. Without treatment to help prevent attacks, a buildup of protein deposits or amyloids, amyloids in the body's tissues and organs may occur, especially in the kidney. So this can lead to kidney failure. Um, if Affected in, so affected individuals are often from um, Mediterranean and Middle Eastern origin. It is typically caused by likely pathogenic and pathogenic variants in the MESE gene, and the gene provides instruction for pyrin, which plays a huge role in keeping the inflammation process under control. It's typically inherited in an autosomal recessive passion, path, pattern, but autosomal dominant has been presented or has been seen treated with colchicine, and a referral to rheumato rheumatology can be considered, and that's often where I send my patients if they come back with these results. 
Um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so there is clinical criteria to follow for the um, clinical diagnosis of Mediterranean fever, and it's based on Tell Hashimer criteria, which is where two or more major symptoms or one major plus two minor symptoms um, meet the diagnosis. Major criteria include recurrent febrile episodes with the inflammation of the serious tissue and the body. So that's the tissue lining of the lungs, heart, and the lining around the abdomen and other organs within. Um, amyloids of AA type within, without a predisposing disease and a favorable response to regular colchicine treatment as well. I believe the trial for colchicine would be three to six months which my patient had only been on colchicine for about a month from when I saw her. Um, minor criteria including recurrent fever episodes, um, erysipelas, like um, erythemia, which is the infection of the upper layer of the skin, and then also have an first degree relative with this diagnosis. It's also been suggested that the diagnosis criteria include typical attacks, incomplete attacks, and then supportive criteria as well. It's really hard to say whether my patient really fit this clinical criteria, especially since she'd only been on colchicine for a short period of time. Um, but her rheumatologist seemed to be very supportive of um, what her PCP had recommended and recommended that she continue to follow that. And move to the next slide. All right, so back to the patient. So my patient had three goals when she came for the appointment. First, she just wanted to review her results and get a better understanding of it, which is reasonable. Next, she was hoping to get a better understanding of the cause of her pain, and she was interested in learning about options, like management options for that pain, in case like if there was like a link with her genetic testing results. Um, lastly, she was interested in learning about the genetic component of aortic abdominal aneurysm and coronary artery disease because of her family history. So while reviewing her personal and family history, I learned that she herself had a splenic artery aneurysm, high cholesterol diagnosed as 40, asthma, and psoriatic arthritis. She has two sons, one with a joint hypermobility. Um, she reported that it was fairly severe, but I don't know all the details about that either. Um, another son with ADHD, and then her brother had passed away at the age of 30 from coronary artery disease. And on her mother's side, she had a mother with breast cancer and two maternal aunts with breast cancer, and it was noted to be postmenopausal. For her father's side, her father died at 80 from carcinoid liver tumor. Um, and he also had a personal history of colon cancer at 60, coronary artery, artery disease, triple A, CHF, AFib, and diabetes. His father died of an aneurysm, unknown age, and unknown location of the aneurysm. So given her previous genetic testing results, in addition to her personal and family history, I made the following recommendations. Definitely, we can do the clinical confirmation testing. The laboratory that we use actually, I believe that they are CLIA certified, but you know, I also wanted to look to see maybe she had another MESB variant that just wasn't detected. So definitely wanted to confirm, but also look into additional findings. And then based on my patient's personal history of high cholesterol and a brother who passed away from coronary artery disease, she wasn't sure had high cholesterol, but you know, we discussed the option of testing for familial hypercholesterolemia or FH. Um, and as I mentioned before, my patient's an information seeker, so she was very interested in that. Um, and then in regard to additional referrals, May have been a little overkill, particularly with the um, connective tissue concerns I had, but I definitely felt like leaning on my comprehensive medical genetics team and the support from other counselors who are more familiar in the adult cancer world too. So given her personal history of the splenic artery aneurysm, psoriatic arthritis, a son with joint hypermobility, a father with a AAA 
I don't know if he smoked or drank. Um, he could have, but then a grandfather with an unknown, an aneurysm of an unknown location as well as an unknown age. I asked her if she would be interested in having a conversation with a geneticist in regards to a connective tissue evaluation. And she, she said that she would. Um, she always kind of wondered about that, especially with her son. Um, and then for the next recommendation, I recommended a referral to adult cancer genetics given the maternal family history as well as the paternal family history. Again, all those diagnoses were supposedly postmenopausal, but she fits criteria. So I'm totally fine with putting that referral in. She was also going to talk to her mom about possibly being seen for that history. Um, but then everything going on with her father and his personal history, I said I would be fine reaching out and putting in a referral for you for them as well. Again, I just felt much better consulting with my colleagues in adult cancer genetics because that's really not my realm and, and to lean on them, they're great. So appreciated that. Um, all right, next slide. So my patient decided to pursue clinical testing to confirm what was identified through consumer initiated genetic testing. And the familiar hypercholesterolemia as well. Um, so she was negative for FH, but she was found to be a carrier for tyrosinemia type one. And for the familial Mediterranean fever testing. So the testing rheumatology order was never canceled. The patient did submit a sample and the result showed the um, K695RMEFE variant. And the lab classified this as a pathogenic variant. Anyone in the audience who is super familiar with this gene has looked into literature on this particular variant, might have some frustrating feelings, but I know I did, <laughs> but that's okay. So anyway, the first lab I will refer to as lab A. So then we got the results back from the testing that I ordered for her, which was from lab B and it was negative. So I reached out to lab B asking them if they detected this variant um, and if, if so, why was it not reported? That kind of information. And the lab actually did identify it, but this lab classifies it as likely benign. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So between the two labs, the classification was very different. You might be wondering why this variant is so tricky. Well, the variant has been reported previously in either a homozygous state or along with another pathogenic MESV variant in multiple unrelated patients with Mediterranean fever. In a series of 90 patients with, from different ethnic groups, the K695 accounted for approximately 3% of the MESV variants identified. There's a high allele frequency in the population databases. Literature suggests that the variant has a mild effect or reduced penetrance. In silico predictors agree that the variant is expected to be tolerated, but the substitution occurs within the B30.2 domain. This is a mutation hotspot in this gene. This region is super important for the function site of pyrin and mutations involved involving exon 10 where this hotspot is represent a gain of function and unleashing the inflammatory response and regulation of apoptosis. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So through my own investigation, of course I started with Slimvar and the classifications are all over the board. So pathogenic five, likely pathogenic five, VUS seven, likely benign one, kind of all over. So then next, I went to Nomad, and it looks like from the Z-score, the sense variants are tolerated, but this is just a statistical measurement, and there can be missense variants that are pathogenic. And then I went to Verisome, which has a lot of support towards pathogenic. However, the B4, BP4 is where they look at like the computer, um, computerized verdict were more lean towards benign. So 10 applications were benign, while two were pathogenic. 
And then Cree Cosler et al. reviewed genome or genotype distributions of 10,370 Armenian patients diagnosed with Mediterranean fever based on the Tel Hashimoto criteria, and 12 were heterozygous for the K695R. So not not a lot, but still there. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then case reports. Um, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Case report noting a 33-year-old Caucasian male with past medical history of recurrent bouts of acute onset knee pain and swelling was also found to have the same variant. Um, he didn't have the greatest response to colchicine. Um, and then the next one, there we go. And then there's also literature suggesting that there is um, arthritis with high in people who had heterozygous K695R genotype. So ultimately, there isn't a clear-cut answer for this variant, one of the tricky ones. Um, this variant could, like they, like some of the classification reasoning being mild effect to reduce penetrance, um, and really, really tricky. But this, the patient I was working with was wonderful. She she got a lot of information kind of thrown at her and she was literally just an information seeker. So it was just quite, quite an interesting case for me. Um, and the next slide. All right, so the next, for, so for my patient, like I said, she was on colchicine and she actually did pretty well. Um, I'm not, I'll have to look back and see if she's still on it. I, last time I did check, she was still taking it. And then she, like I said, she has two sons. So they both pursued testing, both negative for the MESD variant and one is a carrier for tyrosinemia type one. And then at this time, her family hasn't pursued further evaluations or testing. Um, I did reach out to the cancer group and they'd be happy to see her, but nothing has been done with that yet. Probably reach back out to her again. Um, all right, and then for my key takeaways. So I think this case highlights on some important aspects of pre-test counseling that patients may not be aware of when they're pursuing consumer-initiated testing. I, I think that there's some cases that may not need like an elaborate pre-test counseling and it's very individualized, but I feel like spending some time on the possible or some time on the possible results could be very beneficial to patients who are making decisions about genetic testing. And I mean, my patient kind of received three results in, in one since there's, since this was so all over the board when it came to classification. Um, and like I said, she handled it very well. She seemed to have a good understanding of what was going on, um, but that may not always be the case and it could actually leave some patients very confused. And then, also understanding the various variant classifications between different labs is crucial for appropriate patient care. So very simple, the more I understood about the nuances of this variant, the better I could educate my patient on what her results meant. And then lastly, a common theme I feel like, um, patients may be referred for a particular indication but could benefit from additional testing. My patient ended up having testing for FH and then was also referred to a few other clinics. And that is the end of my case. So I will pass it over to Amber for questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Gretchen, Heather, and Kelly for those case presentations. At this time, we will begin our Q&A. Um, we have a couple questions coming in, but please remember to submit any questions that you have through that um, Q&A box. So our first question um, is for Kelly. It's in relation to case one. Um, the question is, did the patient pay out of pocket for clinical confirmation? And if patients do not have the financial means to pay for confirmatory testing, how can we best guide them? Great question. Uh, this is something that um, is a limitation of consumer-initiated genetic testing, um, especially if they don't meet insurance criteria and, and who is um, uh, contributing to payment of genetic testing and counseling services. 
Um, in this case, um, interestingly enough, um, you know, they could have paid out of pocket um, for color testing. Um, they also would have qualified for our family testing program, which offers $50 testing for our full cancer, cardio, and pharmacogenomic panel because of that known familial MSH2 mutation. Um, so technically, they could have um, gone through that family testing program, which would have been a lower cost option, but they did pay out of pocket regardless um, of if it would have been the full uh, kind of $249 price for color testing or the $50 testing in this case. Um, and that was something that I think would, uh, was, you know, really beneficial for the, the patient to, to initiate that testing right away. So she wanted to really find an answer um, soon versus going through kind of the odyssey of going back to her provider and, and requesting testing. Um, so in this case, the, the motivations were there and she was able to, um, to pay out of pocket for that. Um, if, you know, if funds are not available or, um, you know, we recognize that, that even, um, you know, the, the low cost genetic testing options are still a high cost to most individuals. Um, there are some assistance and help in different ways from some of the different labs um, and other uh, different patient groups, depending on their situation. So always helpful to reach out to see what, what options there are. Sometimes uh, labs partner with institutions or things like that that can help. Thank you. Um, and I just have a comment here um, from Michelle, just saying thanks so much for summarizing the takeaways as they're so important to remind ourselves. And so I thought that was excellent um, for your guys' presentation. You, we had a lot of different takeaways, a lot of variety. Um, in the different consumer-initiated genetic testing that you guys presented. Um, I think it's important for us to remember, you know, for example, that sometimes things that are run through these third parties can, you know, actually have true results, um, that not everything is false positives. Um, I'm just really excited to kind of hear about the whole exome um, portion. So thanks so much for sharing all of those takeaways. All right, just checking to see if there's any more questions. We'll give everyone a second or two more to see if any questions come through. All right, well, that does conclude today's member webinar. On behalf of the NSGC webinar subcommittee, I wanna thank all of you for attending the webinar. Um, and also a huge thank you to our speakers for sharing your experiences and your cases. Um, just of note, this webinar recording will be posted to the webinar page of the NSGC website um, within about 48, 48 hours. So thanks again, everyone, for uh, joining us and keep your eyes peeled for our uh, next member webinar um, coming up later this month.